The casual observer. Our night sky may appear as a plain old jet black dome studded with tiny specks of light hanging above our heads indifferent to the woes of our world. Just stars, all cold, distant, pretty much the same, right? Well, actually no. Of course, stars come in a variety of sizes, densities, compositions, displaying unique characteristics and behaviours. You have hypergides, you've got dwarves, red dwarves, white dwarfs, and then you've got exotic stars, the most intriguing, the most alluring, because you see, astrophysicists have theorised their existence and have good reason to believe that they are actually up there. But observing one is incredibly challenging, so much so that they remain hypothetical to this day. Or do they? One type of such exotic object is the fantastically named quark star, and after 60 years since they were first theorized, we might be getting close to confirming their existence. All right, before we tackle the question of what is a quark star, let's address the basics of, well, what is a quark? Quarks are fundamental subatomic particles observed in pairs or triplets bound together by the strong force, which is one of the four fundamental forces of nature alongside with gravity, electromagnetism, and weak force. The aptly named strong force is the strongest of the four, and when it binds three quarks together, we get hadrons, i.e. the subatomic particles found in the nuclei of atoms, protons, and neutrons. As such, quarks belong to one of two fundamental blocks in our universe, bosons, which comprise photons, and fermions, which include electrons and our new friends, the quarks which are not all equal. According to Swinburne University's Encyclopedia of Astronomy, quarks come in six flavors or species, with the rather poetic names up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. But what really matters to us is that quark stars are stars consisting of free quarks. So, well, then, uh, done. Thanks for watching. All right, all right, not so fast, because things are actually a teeny tiny bit more complicated. Now, the thing about quark stars is that they have remained largely theoretical and only possibly, just possibly observed until very recently, but we will get there. The existence of quark stars was first hypothesized in 1965 by Soviet physicists Dmitry Ivanenko and Dmitry Kurgailazy. The two Dmitrys posited the existence of such objects as stars with an intermediate density between a neutron star and a black hole. A neutron star forms when stars with higher mass than our sun go out with a bang, as in a supernova explosion. It's a big bang, but not that big bang. The remaining core has such high density and strong gravity that it collapses onto itself with its constituent atoms compressed together under unbelievable pressure. The pressure crushes together protons and electrons, thus resulting in a soup of only neutrons. These stars are relatively small in size, with an average diameter of only about 19 kilometers, which is about five times the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You know, speaking of stars and all that, ah, but they are also incredibly dense, boasting a mass up to twice that of our sun. So dense, in fact, that if you were to pluck a single teaspoon of matter out of a neutron star, it would weigh 10 million tons. Now, when such a star surpasses a certain critical mass, gravitational pressure crushes its neutrons and the entire celestial object collapses into a black hole, even smaller, much denser, and exerting even more gravity. But what if there was an intermediate stage, a stage in which gravitational forces break down neutrons, releasing the triplets of quarks which constitute them? The soup of neutrons would become a broth of quarks and, well, that's it, that's a quark star. Hypothetically, quarks, which compose each neutron, might even merge with each other, creating so-called strange quarks. These particles might constitute the building block of another variety of exotic star, strange quark stars, or simply strange stars. Astronomers firmly believe that quark stars do exist, but they admit that spotting one is incredibly complicated. For starters, as they are an intermediate step between the neutron star and the black hole, they probably don't last very long. And even if we had all the Hubbles and James Webb Space Telescopes of the cosmos constantly looking for them, it would still be hard to spot them. According to Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State University, from the outside and from far away, i.e. from Earth, a quark star would look pretty much like a neutron star, a massive compact object spewing radiation and hosting crazy strong magnetic fields. There might be some tiny, nearly inscrutable differences in their electromagnetic signature, but nothing that's easy to detect. Telling apart the two varieties is made even more complicated by the fact that quark stars have a knack for role-playing. According to Friedel and Weber, theoretical physicists at the San Diego State University in California, quark stars could come into two main structural varieties. 
bear and dressed. Bear quark stars are composed entirely of strange quarks, including their surface. On the other hand, the dressed variety is enticingly covered in a thin crust made of nuclear matter, i.e. hadrons found in the nuclei of atoms. This latter type shares many properties with neutron stars because of this crust, which would make it very difficult to distinguish between these types of objects. Are we observing a plain garden variety neutron star, or is it actually an exotic quark star in fancy dress? Fortunately, there are other characteristics unique to quark stars which may help in their identification. First, we have size. Our quirky, quarky friends should be smaller in size compared to neutron stars, with a diameter averaging at 16 kilometers. That's uh, four times the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You're welcome. And then we have mass. The mass range for a neutron star is between 0.1 and two times the mass of our sun. On the other hand, quark stars may have no minimum mass. This doesn't mean that they're expected to be light as a feather. On the contrary, their maximum mass may extend to as much as 2.5 times the mass of the sun. In other words, there is an overlap in the mass ranges between these objects. But a body with a mass lower than 0.1 and higher than 2 might make for a potential candidate for a quark star. Another differentiating aspect is the volume to mass ratio. In neutron stars, the volume decreases as mass increases, the smaller, the denser, while bare quark stars specifically are expected to display the opposite. As their volume increases, so does their mass. Next, we have rotation rates, as quark stars are expected to sustain a staggeringly fast rotation. Let's take a neutron star and a quark star of equal mass and challenge them to complete a full rotation. Due to its smaller size, the quark star will complete it in 80% of the time required by the neutron star. All these elements make for a rather complete identikit, one that could be used by researchers to finally identify their first confirmed quark star. But the road of science is long, it's winding, and it's got oh so many bumps. In April 2002, observers working with the Chandra X-ray Observatory took a closer look at an old acquaintance and made a staggering discovery. Their old pal was RJX J185635-375. Great name. Now look, we apologize to all the experts in the field, but please just allow us to call her Roxanne. So, up until then, Roxanne held the claim of being the closest neutron star to our planet at a relatively short distance of 150 light years. Observations conducted in April 2002 revealed that Roxanne shone at a much larger distance from Earth, it's about 450 light years. The Chandra Observatory also took a temperature reading, estimating it at 700,000 degrees Celsius. Finally, Roxanne's diameter appeared to be between four and eight kilometers, too small to be a neutron star. NASA thus organized a press briefing in Washington, announcing that the Chandra staff may have found the first observed quark star. One year later, the Chandra team struck again, conducting observations on 3C58. Or to us, let's call this one Tracy, because why not? Tracy appeared to shine at a distance of 10,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation Cassiopeia. She was believed to be a neutron star born following a supernova explosion, documented by Chinese and Japanese astronomers in August 1181. In April 2003, Chandra observers worked out that Tracy had cooled down at a faster rate compared to what is expected from a neutron star. And no offense to Tracy here, but she appeared 16 times as dim as a neutron star. Was Tracy another possible candidate for a quark star then? Well, unfortunately, we got a report that the Chandra astronomers had to recork their champagne bottles on both occasions. In June 2004, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, in cooperation with the Hubble Telescope, conducted an in-depth analysis of Roxanne. The second set of observations reported a much lower temperature, only 434,000 degrees Celsius and a large diameter at 14 kilometers. Alas, both features excluded Roxanne from being a quark star candidate. Tracy was to experience a similar fate. She was conclusively categorized as a pulsar, a type of neutron star. Other close calls followed throughout the 2000s, at least two according to a report published by Cornell University, XTE J1739285 and PSR B09431010 were first hailed as possible quark stars before observations confirmed their status as being a neutron star and a pulsar respectively. Scientists who stare into the dark pit of the cosmos for a living surely do not lack in the patience and determination department and years later, more candidates were identified. On August the 14th, 2019, the LIGO Observatory detected a new gravitational wave signal, or GW, with promising potential. To clarify, LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's operated by Caltech and MIT, who describe it as, quoting here, a world's largest gravitational wave observatory and a marvel of precision engineering. LIGO exploits the physical properties of light and of space itself to detect and understand the origins of gravitational waves. So, it's pretty 
reliable. Well, this new GW signal, dubbed GW190814, was believed to have originated from a black hole and a nearby object described as a low mass companion. So, we're gonna call this one. Elmer. So, Elmer became the object of a study conducted by Zheng Cao, astrophysicist at SROM, the Dutch Institute for Scientific Space Research. The results were published in September 2022 under the title GW190814, Circumstantial Evidence for Uptown Quark Star. Zheng Cao and team sought to, quote, investigate the possibility that the low-mass companion of the black hole in the source of GW190814 was a strange quark star. This possibility is viable within the so-called two-factor scenario in which neutron stars and strange quarks coexist. Without going into the details of their paper, which would be beyond our grasp in any case, uh, they reach the following conclusion. Our results thus provide circumstantial evidence suggesting the recently reported GW190814 secondary component could be an up-down quark star. Autumn of 2022 made for a fine vintage when it comes to quark star research. In October of that year, a research team led by Viktor Doroshenko, University of Tübingen in Germany, uh, reported the discovery of a neutron star star with a mass well below the theoretical lower limit. The object was located at a distance of 8,150 light years away from Earth at the center of a supernova remnant labeled Hess J1731-347. Let's just call her Hesse, shall we? That one was easy. Doroshenko and his team analyzed data on Hesse collected via the Gaia Space Observatory and the XMM Newton X-ray Space Telescope and were able to determine her diameter, mass, and thermal emission spectrum. Now, Hesse displayed a diameter of 20.8 kilometers, which is pretty close to the average measurement for a neutron star of 19 kilometers. The surface temperature was a toasty 2 million degrees Celsius, also within range for this type of object. But when it came to mass, the Tabugan team were puzzled. Hesse was only as massive as 77% of the sun, far lower than the theoretical lower limit for a neutron star. Viktor Doroshenko and friends acknowledged that previous descriptions of what a neutron star should be like might actually be wrong. Perhaps it was time to revise the theoretical mass ranges for neutron stars, but they also acknowledged another explanation. Hesse was, in fact, a quark star born out of the remnants of a supernova. Hesse proved quite popular with experts, not only in Germany, but also in Italy. Researcher Francesco de Clemente and his team at the University of Ferrara published a follow-up study on May 30, 2024, titled In the Compact Orbit Associated with Hess J1731-347, A Strange Quark Star, a possible astrophysical scenario for its formation. Deep breath. De Clemente and his team honed in on the curious case of Hesse's mass, smaller than the sun's. According to them, the analysis of supernova explosions indicates that, quote, it is not possible to produce a neutron star with a mass smaller than about 1.17 m, m being the mass of the sun here. This fact, quoting again, raises the question of which astrophysical process could lead to such a small mass. Through their study, the team at Ferrari University showed that a mass equal or smaller to one solar masses may be consistent with a strange quark star. Thus, they concluded that, quote, quark stars can successfully explain the properties of a few compact objects, and in particular, the central object in Hess J1731-347. We've also shown that neutron stars can coexist with quark stars. All right, now it'd be fantastic to declare case closed and confirm with 100% certainty that objects such as Elmer and Hesse are indeed quark stars, but... The beauty of scientific discovery is that it always leaves the door open to being refuted. All the candidates identified in the early 2000s turned out to be neutron stars or pulsars, and future observations may produce a similar verdict for our most recent friends. At this stage, one might wonder, but why is it so important to observe and study a confirmed quark star? Well, for starters, quark stars could help us solve the puzzling mystery of gamma ray bursts, or GRBs, and what powers them. Gamma ray light is the most energetic form of light in the universe. As the name suggests, GRBs are short incredibly intense bursts of such light, lasting from just a few milliseconds to some few minutes. These bursts can shine hundreds of times brighter than a supernova, which is to say that they're about one million trillion times brighter than our sun. So, uh, quite bright. So, what could possibly generate such incredible levels of energy? Well, as it turns out, if quark stars were proved conclusively to exist, they would make for a fantastic inner engine for GRBs. As early as January 2002, Richard Uyet and Francesco Sanino at the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen published a model for gamma ray bursts inner engine based on quark stars. According to their model, the surface of quark stars may play backdrop to the generation of particles described as light glue balls or LGBs. LGBs are composed of three gluons, these are subatomic particles which bind quarks together into hadrons. When these new particles decay, they contribute to the generation of a fireball 
fuel, which in turn ignites the gamma ray burst. According to Oyed and Sonino, the model is capable of reproducing crucial features of gamma ray bursts, such as the episodic activity of the engine. Professor Oyed expanded upon his research at Calgary University, publishing in June 2019 a unifying model for long duration gamma ray bursts. This time, the research proposed that long-duration bursts, or LGRBs, may be explained by a quark nova, defined as the violent explosion resulting from the conversion of a neutron star core to quark matter through a process known as quark deconfinement. The result is a star made entirely of quarks. As such, quark novas uh, would be able to release huge amounts of energy. Professor Uyed and Calgary University's Quark Nova project have estimated that the conversion from neutron star to quark star may release 10 to the power of 47 joules of energy. That number is a 1, followed by 47 zeros. It looks like this. We'll show it on screen. It's a lot of zeros. For context, the energy released by the Soviet weapon, the Tsar bomber, was 210 petajoules, which is 210 followed by 15 zeros. Okay, so look, we're talking about numbers so big they probably don't even have a name. And the process of a quark star being born might generate these incomprehensible amounts of energy, which may explain the mystery behind the largest explosions taking place in the universe from GRBs to superluminous supernovae. Being able to observe an actual quark star to better understand this destructive power would be enough to justify continuing research. But there's more to the universe than just destruction, and quark stars may actually hold secrets about the origin of the cosmos. In the phase immediately after the Big Bang, the universe was filled with quarks, floating around in a broth heated at a sizzling 1 trillion degrees Celsius. So, direct study of confirmed quark stars would help astrophysicists and cosmologists better understand our universe's origin story, including how the early building blocks of matter first came together. Quark stars would make for a fantastic astrophysical laboratory. They would allow us to discover properties of matter in a way that is simply not accessible to the Large Hadron Collider or other similar facilities. According to Friedel and Weber, studying quark stars would put researchers, quote, in the domain of high densities and low temperatures. This is a regime that is only accessible to stars, and only stars can tell us what will happen.